goal isn't to live forever. The goal is to create something that will. Welcome to Perspective, a podcast for wedding creators, where we sit down often with a special guest and talk about our many years of experience in the wedding industry so you can learn from us and grow your wedding business. And who are we? Well, I am Simon, and this is my tall glass of water. We are Cinemate Films, two Scottish-based wedding filmmakers who love nothing more than drinking coffee and talking to others in the industry. And we've teamed up with Photography Farm to bring you six special episodes of this podcast in anticipation of Thrive 2024, an all-star wedding photography workshop taught by six phenomenal mentors. This episode is, of course, sponsored by With Jack, but I will get that I will get onto that later in the show. I clearly need more coffee. Uh, but Greg, who are we talking to today? We are talking to John Dolan. Hello, John. How are you? Hello, John. How, how are you guys? <laughs> We're very good, thank you. Fine. Under-caffeinated, clearly, because I <laughs> struggled to get my words out there. Jeez. Have you got yourself a coffee or a drink there? Uh, I'm an iced tea guy, so iced tea. yeah. An iced tea <laughs> kind of guy. Now, is this just... Sacri- sacrilege, I'm sure. <laughs> are you like adding fruits to this iced tea like just yeah just very straight nothing no sugars just keeps me going nice 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 well good well uh, as i said offline this is uh, a complete casual conversation so um yeah let's get into this yeah you've you've obviously got quite a wide career in advertising editorial fine art photography but that's just a list of sort of things can you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do you know the uh the diverse career part of uh my life is is one of the things i'm most proud of because uh you know i came to new york in the late 80s and um i didn't know exactly my place so but i knew i was a photographer it's the only thing i've ever done and i was able to uh, build a career by trying different things. And it was a lot easier in those days to do that. So there were magazines that got me, gave me first chances and got into some advertising, but, um, the stumbling into weddings in the early nineties was my accidental kind of genius plan (laughs) (laughs) that I had no plan for. I just was of that age and everyone I knew was kind of getting married. So, um, my career is based on photographing weddings for people in the photography industry, magazine people. And, uh, and in the nineties, very few people wanted to do weddings. So I had a lot of freedom to invent, to uh, reinvent the genre when nobody else wanted to do weddings. Mm. It's a different deal now. Yeah. I mean, obviously our listeners will know what the industry is like now. What was it like back then? Like what were the, yeah. What, what was it like getting started? I mean, the key thing was that weddings were the lowest form of photography you could do. So uh, serious photographers wouldn't touch them. And uh, everybody was sort of fighting for this small piece of pie with advertising and uh, editorial. Um, Those two genres gave you a lot of great training. Uh, Magazine jobs were really fun and they weren't very profitable, but they were, they would get your name out there. Um, but weddings were just seen as this kind of, uh, a craft, a kind of low art form and, uh, not something that, a, that a serious photographer would want to do because the risk of shooting film in those days and mm. the weddings were not that, uh, grand. And, um, so it just wasn't an attractive thing, but mm-hmm. for me, it was super attractive because it was at this kind of mixture of everything that I shot, families, uh, a little bit of fashion, a little bit of street photography. It was kind of the the nexus of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. What was, I mean, can you still remember your first wedding? Like, I I sort of had, I have a lot of people who fight over who was my first wedding. (laughs) I said, (laughs) you know, I, I shot a lot of family members' weddings and things, but you know, one of my first paid weddings was a family friend. Um, and it was a nighttime wedding in Washington, DC. And I didn't know how to use a flash and it was just <laughs> disastrous from my point of view. Yeah. But, um, 
you know, I learned quickly that you need to have a couple backup systems and also don't shoot winter weddings in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, you said that, but I always think of like, even nowadays, people get so panicky about low light weddings when like, I'm just thinking about all the technology that we have, uh, how good our sensors are and cameras. If you're a digital shooter, um, like how panicked people get nowadays like they just have no idea of what it was <laughs> genuinely <laughs> like. Terror. It was a genuine terror. So how did how did how did you how did you get through it? I suppose. Uh, the- I think I learned quickly what I was good at, and uh-huh. uh, weekend weddings in the country were 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 more in my my line. You know, some photographers are makers of light, and I'm a finder. So I I learned quickly that uh, that I can spot good light and put people into that zone of, of sweet light really quickly. But, you know, in November, December in the Northeast is dark at <laughs> four o'clock. So uh, you guys would know what that's like. And um, mm. uh, so I really just sort of, you know, you self-select, you, you, you make a portfolio full of a certain kind of pictures mm-hmm. um, and those clients were drawn to me. So it was, it was really the, the the sort of secret at the beginning was that I was finding people who loved photography and wanted me to come to their wedding and just make beautiful photographs. There was no such thing as a shot list in the nineties that was made up in the blogs of the two thousands. <laughs> you must've um, been living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, the budgets were, if you take a zero off the budget, that's, that was, you know, yeah, the, yeah. the weddings were, you, you'd shoot a wedding for, a thousand dollars or 2,500 mm-hmm. was a big payday. And, um, but that came with a lot of freedom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so some people are still there, but I suppose with inflation and, and that, it, yeah. yeah. Um, other than, you know, that experience of shooting in the dark, what were some of the earlier challenges that you had as a photographer, it's especially, you know, getting into weddings, like, or, or did it come naturally for, for the most part? I, I was going to say it's what was so strange was how comfortable I was from the beginning. Uh-huh. If I compared it to, you know, in the same month, I would have a corporate shoot, a portrait of a CEO. Those jobs freaked me out, but I'd go to a wedding and I realized it was, you know, eight hours to make pictures or two days or something. Mm. And there were so many photographs to be made that it was kind of effortless compared to the more prescriptive ad jobs or magazine jobs. So um, I think it just, it suited me so well that it was this kind of matching uh, the right person for the right subject. Um, I mean, it's also... Uh, I, I think a lot of people put so much pressure on themselves to make their career, you know, on this kind of big line towards success. And I had a much slower ride in, and um, I wasn't in a rush. I wanted the right people to find me. And, uh, and also there was so little competition. There was really, mm. there were not a lot of people in New York doing it. So I was able to just pass some weddings on to friends and, take the ones for, for people who really got it. And I think that's been sort of the secret of my success is that, you know, say you pick a number of how many weddings you want a year, say it's 20 for me, it's at this point now it's 10. Mm -hmm. That means I need to find 10 cool people a year. And in a funny way, I think a lot of photographers try to gain as many customers as they can when in fact, I think you want the right number of customers, the right customers and to fit that number. So it's this sort of, it's a strange, uh, marketing approach, but it's, it's, it's really like being that, that food truck that just sells a certain amount and that's all they make that day or some yeah. sort of limited market. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you can make it sustainable for 30 years. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Uh, you mentioned finding couples. I think to many photographers when they talk about marketing and it is, well, I suppose they do, they do talk about finding their ideal client, but 
I, I wonder how many people think of it as trying to find cool cu- cool couples instead of just hoping that go- they find you. Hoping that they find yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it's really the secret that I mean, if I can impart any wisdom on people, it's it's that more is not necessarily better, and every wedding. Uh, I mean, the value of a shooting a wedding for somebody who really gets what you do that maybe that's a lower rate Mm. versus somebody who doesn't get you, but they'll pay the higher rate. I would always take the wedding where somebody gets you because that wedding will then get you two more people who get you and their friends will get you. It's, it's, it's such a word of mouth business. Mm. I mean, I've never advertised. It's always been word of mouth because, uh, if you, uh, I mean, I, I also compare it to midwives. <clears throat> like when we had our first child, I didn't look in the newspaper for the best midwife in New York. Uh-huh. I asked a friend who just had a kid, so I, you know, do you have anybody you recommend? Mm. And it's the same sort of thing. Brides are not looking, maybe they're looking on Instagram, but if they get a word from a really cool friend of theirs that this person's great, that's the end you need. Uh huh. So it's it's uh, it's it might be a little bit simpler than people think. And mm-hmm. um, I again wonder how many people out there are thinking. Well, not the thing. Maybe their minds blowing at the fact that you've just said that you don't market yourself at all. Like, I mean, I know you have a social media account and you have a website, but yeah. apart from those two things, it's it's mostly word of mouth, like you just said. It is. It also it's also helpful that I'm I've been in the industry long enough that I know a lot of planners and mm. you know maybe ninety percent eighty five percent of my weddings come from wedding planners. Yeah. But I think there's also you just have to look out. There's a lot of chatter going on between uh, people who get engaged. Mm-hmm. They share their lists. So you know, in a funny way, the your potential customers are at every wedding. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I'm handing out my business card at weddings, but Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making allies at every wedding and, um, and I'm not shy about when I meet somebody who I really connect with, I say, you know, call me when you get married or when you get engaged or something like that. It's a, it's a constant kind of process of, of um, looking, who are my people who understands photography in the way I do mm-hmm. and who shares my approach. Yeah. You yeah. didn't happen to marry a planner, did you? <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because we just we just had a podcast episode uh, with Joy Zamora, another Thrive speaker, uh, yes. and he actually, his wife is a, is yeah. a planner. So I just thought that was yeah, that's just cheating. <laughs> well, that's, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's definitely a cheat code, yeah. <laughs> I found so, that really funny. So with 30 years in the industry, would you say your style of photography has changed in those 30 years much? I don't think you can change. I think, I think, uh, you establish a way of seeing the world and that's kind of it. You know, I, maybe I will play with different cameras, different seasons and try new things, keep it fresh. But, you know, uh, I think a lot of my pictures are a reflection of my personality and I am who I am. So, uh, it's that, um, that kind of connection is is made by the just me being at the wedding. Yeah. Um, so you know, I've never really done a full on change and switched systems and done anything dramatic like that. I, mm-hmm. I go to the wedding. Um, I'd say I've more evolved or refined my approach. Yeah. And at this point, I really want to be that uh, welcome guest. I'm almost like a guest with a camera oh, yeah. and uh, I want to shoot the wedding from the inside. I don't want to be the vendor who's bossing people around. Um, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's a different approach. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming this is going to be the case as well when it comes to your, your commercial work. Like I'm assuming you just see photography as as the art form and the skills and the way that you see the world kind of you just apply those skills to commercial, then to weddings and to whatever, right? So your skill, yeah. your your style doesn't change whatever you're doing. Right. It's 
the commercial work is um, it's not very sexy. It's but it's I'd say the adjective I would I would use is that it's human. So I'm yeah. doing corporate portraits at a big bank, and I'm making those people look more natural than the corporate portrait. So I'm sort of uh, uh, unplugging it a bit and yeah. uh, keeping it real. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, obviously, in you know, doing my pre-show uh, research on you, and you know, finding your book and looking at your website, like it's it's very clear that you've you, you've had the privilege of you know, photographing some, um, I don't want to use the word celebrities, but, you know, Naomi Biden, um, Anna Sophia Robb and Kate Bosworth, uh, to name a few of the uh, individuals that you have photographed. Um, how, how, do, how do these events differ from, you know, your, your, your average wedding? That's a good question. I think it's... Um when it works and when it's worked really well is when I don't change. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Anna Sophia Robb, for instance, was a very, she's a young actress mm -hmm. has an incredible spirit and very open hearted. And, uh, she's well known, but she's not a fussy celebrity. She shouldn't have people around her controlling it. Um, and she just wanted me to be there and do my thing. So mm. she gave me a lot of freedom and a lot of, uh, she was just very real. So it was a fun weekend in the country. And uh, it was really one of the dreamiest things because she looks amazing in camera and she, her spirit is her is beautiful and her personality is great. So mm. um the, the Biden wedding was fantastic, but I was also lucky enough. There was another team of photographers doing a lot of the uh, more formal pictures. Or, so I had, um, they were doing one thing and I was free to do my thing, mm -hmm. which really was a great setup. And, um, but it was also, you know, one of the greatest experiences of my life, especially being from Washington, being a native, the yeah. DC area, uh, it was just an extraordinary experience because I got to use my gift and apply it in a kind of historical setting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, these ones that you're mentioning and Simon mentioned involve noteworthy people, but is there any weddings throughout the years that have like left a mark on you that have a good story that, that always stick in your mind? Mm. You know, it's it's th over 350 weddings now. <laughs> There's, I, how long do we have? <laughs> um, it's um, it's really these tiny moments of of deep meaning that are that stick with me. These kind of less dramatic ones. But um, one of my early big weddings, probably 25 years ago, was for a. a really interesting family in Detroit and they had 800 guests at their wedding in their backyard and they were philanthropists, really a fantastic family. Mm -hmm. And the bride, when she walked into the tent for dinner and everybody stood up, um, is one of those moments where I just saw the energy, how the energy is transmitted at a wedding and where this many people focused on this one person and her husband, who was completely freaked out by all the people, but she just, <laughs> it seemed to me as if she was floating because she, she took the energy and, um, and I realized at that moment that as a photographer, you can respond to the energy too. And mm. I flowed with it and the pictures of them, their first dance are kind of extraordinary because there was so much, uh, love and excitement and, and there was great music and, you know, you sort of feel all that stuff in the air. And, mm. you know, I kind of think that's our job is to be sensitive to these, uh, these forces in the, in the air. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I do, I do want to go back to, um, the present store, um, her wedding. Uh, and I, I, I want to apologize cause I'm sure you've been on other podcasts and I'm sure they've asked you something along the lines of what was what, like, this might be repeating. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, what, what was it like 
to be booked for that wedding just as like you mentioned it was a historical um it, you know there was historical importance and you know there's a privilege with that but what did it feel like to you when, when you booked that wedding like when you were asked to to capture such a special event yeah and i know all weddings are special i didn't mean that i didn't, no, no, I didn't no, mean no, to say no, that no. but that, like no yeah no it was <clears throat> I had met um, Naomi at another wedding, so I had that sort of connection with her beforehand, and mm, okay. I met her when she was getting her fitting for her dress, and so I had a few interactions with her. But um, it, when I get when I got that call, I just realized that you know I've been working at this for thirty years, and this was this kind of pinnacle moment, and mm. and instead of being terrified or dreading it i just i sort of channeled any anxiety into adrenaline and just um i just realized that you know you get certain chances in life and this is one of them mm. um so i you know i and it's all top secret too which was made it even more fun so <laughs> yeah you know it's like oh i'm just going down to washington for the weekend and, um, <laughs> but but i just think it's um we, we work hard on our craft, we perfect the way of working. And this was one of these moments where I was able to kind of shut everything off and just be a photographer. I didn't have to think about uh, what cameras to use. I knew exactly how I wanted it to flow. Um, and I'm a sort of history buff. So I knew that this was the first wedding at the White House since Nixon's daughter, 1971. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So, you know, just it was it was one of these things where you just look yourself in the mirror and you go, "You're good at one thing. Go do your thing." Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Were you were you nervous on the day? Like, because I'm just I'm trying to put myself in a that kind of position, and all I can think of is, "Fuck, I'd be shitting myself." <laughs> like, oh my god! Like, <laughs> well, it was it was three days of activities, and so okay. um, the minute I saw her getting dressed, and I was and I was able to sort of see her face to face i was like let's go let's just make pictures the yeah, yeah. beforehand stuff of, uh, you know we we're getting tested for covid every morning and the terror of coming this close to this moment great moment in your life and then getting a negative getting a positive test you know oh. that's that was the biggest worry yeah but after i got the you know negative test it was like let's let's do this yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely and you and you mentioned there was other there was other teams there um you know taking images and, and making content did did that help you you know zone into that creative yeah, you know mindset exactly exactly yeah it, and we all worked together we all kind of moved together mm -hmm. uh staying at the same hotel and it was very it was a lot of camaraderie um yeah. and it was kind of a shared experience so that you know on saturday night at midnight when we were walking back to the hotel we were all just you know we had been formed through battle <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah like knowing the importance of that moment and first yeah. wedding since the 70s did you like go in with any sort of ideas of compositions or how to use the historic backdrop of the white house did you have any preconceived ideas going into it i did um my main idea was not to play it safe i thought this is too important to make boring pictures so um and it, i think there was an advantage too that i this is my hometown so i knew the light i knew what the light would be like in november i knew what it'd feel like and washington's very kind of thin and crisp light in autumn and um and that's what the light was like that morning like it was a crystal clear beautiful uh chill in the air but not too cold and um and i i kind of had an inner sense of how i wanted to uh approach the ceremony itself and one of my mantras is never leave the bride so the other people were at the end of the aisle getting the bride coming down the aisle but i stayed back with her and i think that you know that's always been my gut that 
that moment before is as interesting as the moment that the bride walks down. So mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite pictures was from that where she's standing inside the White House about to walk out and there was nobody else there but me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was kind of thrilling and but I wanted the house itself to be part of the story. So I was very conscious of the uh, just the, the architecture and the light coming in the windows. It's really exquisite, mm. uh, an exquisite building. And it's, you know, smaller than you think. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, you mentioned, you know, you didn't, you didn't want to create a boring image. What, what is a boring image to you? I, you know, just something expected and something so perfect and composed and um, where it could have been done by anybody. You know, wow. I kind of have this measure of if your second shooter could have taken the same picture, then you're not pushing it. So mm -hmm. I was trying to make pictures that were coming from my experience and all the uh, excitement I felt and the um, you know, you kind of try to fold everything into the picture, what you're feeling as well as what the subject is feeling. And mm -hmm. then it becomes more than a wedding picture. I wanted, basically I wanted to make photographs at this wedding so yeah. instead of just basic wedding pictures. Yeah. yeah. I actually really like that. And obviously having gone through your portfolio, like you, you do achieve that because there's not one image that I thought, Oh, another wedding image or, uh, yeah. you know, Oh, uh, uh, portrait of a couple and they're just in the middle and the whatever every image is unique in its own right um and I, I obviously i did mention the show and tell that we'll do at the end of the podcast um i think the image that you were talking about um with naomi i think that is one of the images that i have selected so yeah. it'll be good to hear a little bit more about your thought Excellent. processes were there any unexpected moments that you thought, right, I, I need to change how I'm doing things right now during that wedding in particular. Any, any moments that kind of caught you off guard? You know, I think the whole weekend was kind of a uh, tightrope walk, really. So there was, um, because I didn't, we never knew where we were going to be or what access we would have. Um, so I think that it was this ultimate test of, of staying neutral and staying, um, I'm really big on staying on balance at a wedding and not getting thrown off uh, because at every wedding you go to, there's going to be something that is unexpected. Yeah. And are you ready for that? How do you prepare for a constant I mean, that's the best skill set that wedding photographers get these days mm. is that you're having to respond and react. Uh, you think you're going to take people in one place and then you, the light goes bad there. So you have to quickly decide on new things. So, yeah. um, I mean, there were, because there was another crew, we had to take turns at certain point of doing portraits and, um, but that just, you know, that's the thing where you take a, challenge and you turn it to your advantage uh -huh. um so that was that was basically my approach was anytime i ran up against anything it's like find a solution fast <laughs> yeah uh, yeah absolutely uh and you're right i think i think as you know people who work in the wedding industry so a lot of the time you've got a few moments to capture a specific thing that's happening um so yeah i do think that's a skill that you need to learn very very quickly um you are the author uh, of the perfect imperfect, uh, the wedding photographs of John Dolan. What was your inspiration behind one wanting to create uh, a book, and and two, what was your what was your experience in, in actually pulling together images, and you know what's your thought behind this particular book that you made? So you won't maybe you won't be surprised, but it took me ten years to put that book together <laughs> <laughs> wow so okay it, you know i would work on it in between seasons and i would um add pictures to it take them out and and then i spent maybe i spent a couple of years going around to publishers in new york 
and having each one of them say, why would anybody want to look at other people's wedding pictures <laughs> or wedding? Why would weddings be a, you know, that would be in the gift section of the bookstore. And, um, it was incredibly, uh, not depressing, but it was challenging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I've, you know, you hear this from authors, uh, I, I'm sure JK Rowling got rejected a bunch of times. There's, I think there's a lot of these stories, mm. but when it's happening to you, it's no comfort to hear that, those stories. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, I've gotten rejected enough. So, um, <clears throat> but I knew that I had this archive of pictures that nobody else had. There weren't that mm. many people who've been doing it for as long as me. And there's basically, there just aren't that many people who think about weddings as much as I do or, you know, who, who are that into weddings. So I knew I had a body of work. Um, uh, I just needed to find the right editor and the right, um, publisher and it happened right in the middle of the pandemic. So that was kind of a, uh, a gift. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Like the title is quite intriguing. The perfect imperfect. Like, is there, how do you draw the line between when, cause people often think, okay, that image isn't perfect. I'll call it. That's not a good image because it's not perfect. So how do you draw the line between when it's not perfect is good and can there, does that mean there can't be any bad images? Mm. No, um, and that's a great question because I think that's the trap that some people are falling into. The The test is whether it's a believable, a believable picture. So uh, I, I think with the title, I'm kind of playing with the wedding industry a little bit and i'm sort of messaging saying uh it, weddings aren't perfect marriage is not always perfect why should we put forth this false idea of that every wedding picture should be perfect in the best day of your life and all this pressure i saw a lot of people getting pressure on them brides saying social media is saying everything has to be perfect and then mm they get grass on their shoes and they flip out. So <laughs> I was intentionally kind of messaging to people saying, if I showed you two pictures, the perfect version and then the imperfect version, I'm going to convince you that this imperfect picture has more heart and soul to it. That's, mm. that's kind of the, the test. Is it believable? Is it, does it uh, hit you in a certain way in your heart? Does it, make you think of something that you haven't thought of. So, um, but I'm, I'm very worried that it's, there's going to be a AI app for making pictures, <laughs> taking perfect pictures and messing them up. Or, I, I'm or sure I, I'm filter. John, I am pretty sure there's already <laughs> stuff out there. Like, yeah. cause it's, it's kind of on trend at the moment. Yeah. Isn't it, it worries me. It, you never want to be on trend. <laughs> <laughs> Then it's going to crash. John, you've been in this industry for 30 years. It was bound to come around. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was bound to happen. Uh, yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah, it happens with everything as well, yeah. by the way. Like, like if you have kids, you'll know the fashion comes around. Like, those bell bottoms are now in. I'm like, bloody hell, man. <laughs> I'm just looking at my, my younger self when my son is wearing some crazy baggy yeah. jeans i'm like you step in a puddle and you're gonna have water up to your knees but okay <laughs> you know it's it's up to you yeah go, um, going through you said it took you 10 years to like go through your images and choose what to put in the book did did you learn anything about your own work from going through that process i i learned that i haven't gotten better and i haven't gotten worse <laughs> it, it, like okay. if you look at yeah. the dates in the book there are pictures from the late eighties and pictures from 2020 mm. or 2019. So that was kind of a, uh, that was a gratifying thing that I haven't peaked or haven't, uh, I'm not done yet. Um, but I, you know, I went to, uh, I worked with an incredible art director and I put out maybe 200 pictures or 300 pictures and she really helped call them down and find the pictures that had this kind of, that stood on their own, uh, and, and I think that's, that's what I'm proud about the book, um, is that every picture, I think every picture holds up on its own as a photograph. Mm -hmm. Um, I should say that the books, I think it's sold out and we're working on a oh. possible second edition and, uh, we'll see about that. 
Oh, you Stay son tuned. of a bitch! I was just, I was just, <laughs> lo- I was just looking it up on Amazon to see if I could get it. <laughs> Does that say you can buy it for seven hundred ninety nine pounds? Yep. <laughs> somebody, yeah. somebody's selling it on Amazon for eight hundred pounds. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it's actually John. It's actually. John. <laughs> Oh my Busted. god! Busted. Yeah, you you use the word believable when you're you know describing mm. what a bad and good image is. What what is what is believability to you in terms of like an image? Because oh, wow, well, yeah. I th- I, th- I think that you know the pictures where the uh, the subject is putting on a face for you. Mm. Uh, okay, uh, I don't direct people a lot. Maybe I'll guide them into good light and let and give them really light touch ideas but i'm not going to tell somebody to nuzzle or put your cheeks together or something because i don't believe that those pictures Mm -hmm. but i want i want the emotion that's on the page to uh be real from their point of view and from my point of view yeah Uh, and i think that freaks out a lot of younger photographers that you know what happens if you get a couple who's not uh feeling it or if they're awkward Mm. and i just think you that's kind of the job of the photographers to either wait or make them comfortable or Mm -hmm. give them a glass of wine or you know (laughs) yeah but 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 making a template out of it and telling people okay i watched this video about how to direct people so now i'm going to tell you how to hold your lover that's just yes it's not it's, it's no fun. Uh-huh. Like a pose, you, you you see all the time, kind of posing guides, and yeah, not 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 to say that posing guides are bad for all those listeners who have used <laughs> them. I'm sorry, I know it's terrible. Um, I think it's just a challenge. I, I like to challenge people to see what you can get without uh, interjecting yourself because it's it's not your wedding; it's their wedding. Yeah, they should be feeling something real. Mm-hmm. How- how do you feel then when, like, if another photographer was to justify it, they'd be like, well, a couple's come to me for my style. Like, yes. is that, like, it's almost like you're kind of saying that the couple want you to put that kind of spin on their wedding? Is that is that just? Yeah, and, like, I, and I should say that this, that this has worked for me, and hmm. I get a lot of shy couples who who don't like being photographed, they're awkward in front of the camera and they admit that. Um, I think the, the couples who want direction find those photographers, they're drawn to those photographers who are going to make them glam and uh, make them feel like Hollywood stars and stuff. Those people don't hire me. And that goes back to the point that if you have a finite number of clients you need, you know, you have to tell them who you are. Mm. I tell, make it very clear to my couples in messaging that I'm imperfect and I'm not going to direct. <laughs> so I attract <laughs> yeah. those people who, who want a level of honesty and uh, subtlety. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you have to basically uh, imagine you're an actor and what a casting director is going to give you a role for. Mm. What kind of, you know are you a character actor? Are you a leading man? Are you an action hero? You have to define yourself in a kind of clear way. Mm-hmm. Okay. I yeah. get that. Um, th- does that come through in your brand as well? Like, or do you, do you even put a lot of effort into your brand? I know it's, uh, you know, the, the things that I do, uh, I think one of the big things I do is that if somebody emails me an inquiry, I, I say, call me, let's yeah. talk on the phone. I don't have a form on my website making people fill out and all that sort of stuff. I think that's, I think that's very businessy and I don't want to seem like a business professional. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of anti-professional. I'm, I'm a specialist and I'm, but I'm just a guy in a house in the country. So it's like, call me, let's talk about your wedding. And maybe that is too much for a lot of people, but I think you learn a lot by, you know, a 20 minute conversation with somebody. I can get a lot out of that. And if it's not right for me, I give the weddings to my friends, pass, give them recommendations for people. But I guess I'm saying just make it more personal rather than professional. Yeah. Shit, Greg, a, Greg we're, we're, we're too businessy. <laughs> change, change the website. Change the website. Fuck. 
<laughs> Delete the contact form. <laughs> <laughs> still, make me, still making me panic, John. Jesus. No, I mean, I, I would be curious to, to have somebody push back on that and say, you know, the contact form really works. Or what if you changed all the questions and made them really funny, quirky questions like, what's your favorite movie? Or mm-hmm. like, I want to find out, do I want to work with you? Do I want to fly across the country and spend the weekend with you? Yeah. Yeah. Or are you just sending out 10 inquiries looking for, you know, bids from 10 photographers? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I get that. And we've all had those emails. Yeah. Yeah. So. Dear, so, dear blank. <laughs> <laughs> Send me your pricing. <laughs> uh, John, apologies. I'm going to do a little bit of self-promotion like Greg mentioned. I am a... Go for it. I'm a self-promotion slag. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, John. <laughs> Um, if you've enjoyed this uh, conversation, you can follow us on youtube.com forward slash at Perspective by Cinema. Uh, and don't forget to buy your tickets to Thrive. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Before we get into some of this more businessy and other stuff, what what equipment are you shooting on for anyone who's interested in that sort of stuff? What's your camera and lens of choice? I use old Rolleiflex. I use a uh, Leica M6, Leica M10, um, and some other quirky cameras that I don't tell everybody about. <laughs> so they'll all go buy them. <laughs> yeah, those, those eBay prices on film cameras and stuff are just <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. 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 So, so you've got a number of bodies. What are your go-to lenses? And and even because not many people shoot. F- film or or they kind of do on the side because they're not very confident with the stuff yeah. they're going to get on film you know there's a lot of like hesitation so yeah run it run us through your your whole your whole kit bag your your everything <laughs> yeah i keep it pretty i actually keep it pretty tight now i used to bring a million different cameras but i sort of have a daytime bag and then a nighttime bag but i use the Rolleiflex has always been my main camera and I can load it faster than anybody I've ever met. So I'm open to any challenges. Um, but um, I for for the Leicas, I just use 35 and sometimes a 50, but not that much. So mostly just the 35. Um, and the digital's quite good because I can go, you know, inside and outside seamlessly and uh, with the automatic ISO. Um you know, I don't know. It just it's 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 find your find your equipment and be so fluid with it that if all hell's breaking loose, you can take pictures without thinking. That's kind of the main goal. Um, and and if you're if you're into film, you know you you have to have your brain right because film and digital are kind of the opposite where you have to overexpose film and underexpose digital. And yeah. that was a steep learning curve <laughs> for me, for somebody when I first got my, you know, first 5d, I was just like overexposing is not so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> oh my Lord. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I, I, uh, for corporate stuff, I, I'll use an old 5d, with the 85 1.2 um it's a beautiful mm-hmm. portrait lens but but i i don't i don't like cameras with lots of sub menus and and with uh, <laughs> instruction books that are thicker than a novel um yeah so cuz i can't uh, my brain doesn't work that way and i'm never going to read a manual so mm. um yeah i i i it's I mean, I have a closet full of cameras and I kind of stand in front of the closet before a job and say, who wants to come out and play? <laughs> who haven't I used for a while? <clears throat> so yeah. I'm an old, definitely an old, old camera shop hunter and, uh, mm. but I don't think I need anything else. So yeah, the, I, I have noted. So during the pandemic, I actually got quite into film and I was, you know, shooting black and white all the time. And I was developing in my shower, all, nice. all my film. Um, I, I, I don't do it anymore because the price of film, holy yeah. shit. If it's just a hobby, then yeah, it's expensive hobby. Like, yeah. yeah. Has it not come down a little bit? I thought the prices were oh, coming down. Oh, it might. I mean, I was, I had looked, I had looked at, you know, going back into it maybe a few months ago. So yeah. I know it was, it might've been at the peak. 
<laughs> but honestly, I was like, nah, I can't, I just can't, I can't. I love my kids, but I don't need, I don't need a, another role of black and white film just with my kids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do, I do justify it that uh, one great film shot for me is is so valuable that and it gives a, a richness because i'm a film native yeah. um and i worked in dark rooms for years that there's something about it f f for me in particular but i have friends uh who just say it really doesn't matter nobody should know mm. what you're using and you know those those couples who say i'm hiring you because you're a film photographer mm. like, you won't know I'll, I'll blend it all together you'll never know yeah you're you're absolutely right I you know, I think for me, it was the, the, re like, it was almost the threat of missing a shot. Yeah. So I would spend, I would like make sure that the exact moment I wanted was the, when I decided I'm not just hitting spray and pray, like, brrr, like, yeah. and, and when you have that, there's kind of like a, an extra weight that you put on images. Oh, I, yeah, I mean, that's an intentionality. That's just, yeah. 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 So, I mean, although I've, I've shot maybe, you know, well, I don't know how many rolls of film, but the majority of those rolls at least have a, a print, like at least there's one frame that I've printed out from maybe mm. every single roll and they've gone up in my house, but I have like tens of thousands of iPhone yeah. photos that just yeah. live on digital. So there's, I, I suppose there, there's a there's something to be said about that. But, um, well, there's a <clears throat> sorry. I, I remember when digital first came out. I kept thinking that there's a unbearable lightness to digital. That there's no weight to it. There was no mm. pain in taking a bad picture, so you just end up taking a lot of bad pictures. <laughs> and with film, if you take a bad picture, you're just you feel it in your gut. You mm. feel ill <laughs> if you yeah. blow a roll or you uh, so um, there's there's something that that affects your brain in a positive way that makes you really conscious and really uh, you, you put your heart into it yeah. so maybe have some you know have a few rolls around the house and for special <laughs> moments <laughs> yeah yeah I, th I think I'm yeah. because I mean I, I mean we, even we've got some rolls of film in the fridge actually yeah. now I think yeah. about it there are, there are rolls lying around but it's, um, well, yeah. I mean, one of the things I do is that sometimes I, it's almost like I'm sketching with digital and then I'll shoot film if it's feeling right. Yeah. So okay. even on a wedding day, I'm, you know, I'm shooting a little bit digitally and if I see something, I go, okay, this is good enough for film. Yeah. Do you take the same approach when you're shooting film to when you're shooting digital? Because I know probably a lot of photographers struggle with, I don't know if this is an actual term, but chimping. So they, they'll they'll take an yeah, image and they're term. they're back. Yeah. They're like looking at the back of the camera, and when you disappear into your technology, everyone around you is gone. Like you're yeah. gone. Like nothing's happened. Like do you, do you ever? And and is that an actual term? Yeah. Right. Okay. It's actual. Oh, it term. That's a, great. That's great. And you know where the term came from? Uh, no. If you watch a photographer when they look at, they look a little bit like a chimp. Right. Okay. <laughs> so it's a real, that's it's fair. a real term. Okay, that's good. Because I mean, that's what I thought it was, yeah. but it just sounds so ridiculous. But uh, yeah. yeah, I get it. But, but I think you're right. I think when I see other photographers at a wedding, if I'm a guest or something, I see them chimping. I just think the wedding is passing by at a high speed, and yeah. you you might want to keep your nose out of it so you know i'll peek at my screen for a second mm -hmm. um just to, to see if i like the exposure i also turn my screen to black and white so oh, yeah i'm shooting uh, i'm shooting raw but it looks black and white yeah yeah and there's something to that which makes me just feel really good about myself because black and white so forgiving so you think <laughs> everything looks great <clears throat> um but it's it's simplifying the thing but so it gives me a little bit of confirmation um but my basic rule is the in in good light film is better and in bad light digital is better uh -huh. so the you know if i'm out on the beach or in the snow or something film or bright sunshine film is just going to be so gorgeous mm -hmm. uh but in a candlelit room 
as we talked about in November, the digital just is extraordinary. Yeah. 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 I get that. Um, obviously we've, we've spoken about so much of your work, but like how, how would you describe your work? It's like, and I know like if you look, you can very clearly see it. Many of your images are on your website and there's the old, the old adage of, uh, photograph is a thousand words, <laughs> you know, but you know, couples do find us as creative individuals and they are almost certainly usually clueless in terms of like, like describing things uh, in a creative way, especially when it comes to like visual arts. Yeah. So, so it, when a couple come to you and they ask, Hey, so what, what is your style? Like, what is it that you say? I would say that I'm, I'm really a narrative photographer. So I'm, I'm, taking photographs of what it felt like to be at your wedding, mm -hmm. not necessarily what it looked like, but um, it, there's almost like a story running through these pictures. That's not an exact story. It's closer to a short story uh -huh. or a novel. It's not a newspaper recording saying on this day at this time, this happened. Yeah. It's saying, you know, I was at this wedding and uh, yeah, I always think about, when a photographer comes home from a wedding and tells the story to their partner or spouse, do you have a picture of that extraordinary story you're telling? Mm. Do you have some pictures that bring somebody who wasn't at the wedding to that moment? Mm. Or, um, so it's, 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 I think it's what's kept it fascinating for so long is that I see every wedding kind of as a mystery to be solved. Like, what's going to happen on this day with these two people? And, and so I'm photographing that mysterious, uh, coming together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, I'm sorry, it's all right. I was going to, I was going to change gears a wee bit. Well, go so, for it. Will, we've been talking about like photography and styles and stuff a lot. What about the business side of stuff? Cause a lot of newcomers to the industry, feel like they struggle a bit more with that because they know how to use a camera. They know how to look for composition and stuff. So have you faced any challenges in more of the business side of your photography work over the years and how have you overcame them? That's interesting. Cause I would have thought it's the opposite. I, th I would have thought the, the young photographers I'm meeting are so sophisticated on marketing and business, but they haven't studied art or they mm. don't read novels or they don't watch old French films or things. But, um, I mean, I, yeah, my business has been incredibly, I don't, I don't even know how I survived 30 years in New York, um, as a freelancer because it's, there's so much uncertainty and, um, we've gone through multiple recessions and, mm. uh, but I think because I had that diversity of, weddings and other things that I was able to, you know, kind of carry through. But, um, I think, I think you have to balance the art and commerce constantly. If you're too strong on, if you're really good on marketing and business, then go to a museum. And if you're, you know, super artsy, you might want to learn Excel or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think, you know, the skill set I would encourage everybody to have would be, that I wish I had would be being a master of spreadsheets and a master of video editing. Mm. I think those are really uh, good skills to have, neither of which I have. So <laughs> <laughs> tip for the young. I, I wonder for the people who are in the middle, if they're just like content creators now, they're good at creating content, but they're also good at marketing and that's how they've yeah. become a thing yeah have you ever worked with content creators at weddings before no you mean the people who <clears throat> shoot behind the scenes videos or yeah usually found on their iphone yeah only yeah. once yeah How, what was yeah, your what was your experience uh she was fantastic actually and really didn't want to get in the way and she was tiny. She was really small. <laughs> so she kind of was perfect for it, yeah. Yeah. but she had a positive attitude. Oh, cool. you know, I have a harder time with big video crews getting in my way when I'm shooting solo. Mm. I shoot a lot of wedding solo yep. and then the bride hires a video crew. And all of a sudden it went from, you know, very understated and quiet and chill to, you know, 
<laughs> drones and <laughs> yeah. sliders and zooms and things. So yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> as a, I, I'm putting myself as a spokesperson for all video people. I'm sorry, we're arseholes. It's true. There's some great ones out there. I'm sure it's the same with photographers. <laughs> I'm sure there are. Um, yeah. So, so talking. Obviously, we've mentioned about your commercial kind of work, and you do weddings, but you and and the fact that you've mentioned that you only shoot ten weddings a year. Like looking at all of your work as a whole, how do your bookings kind of break down? Like, how many commercial jobs do you do? How many? Uh, weddings and and other like engagement shoots or anything like how 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 many of each do you tend to want to book a year and and stay sane um on the assumption you want to stay sane i, I don't know maybe you're crazy <laughs> as, all, as all hell i don't know <laughs> you know the balance for me now is i have some very loyal corporate clients so I don't know what piece of the pie that would be, maybe 25%. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the weddings are, they're often three day affairs. So 10 is, is a, you know, it's a big chunk of time and energy. Um, and I do engagement shoots as part of my whole package with people and I don't charge for that, but so that takes up a little bit of time, but it's a great investment in the relationship between everybody getting to know before the wedding yeah um and then i have certain families where i do this kind of family documentary uh of people whose weddings i shot 20 years ago and and those are incredible relationships oh, yeah. trying to reinvent family photography from cheesy to honest and, <laughs> um, and i do nonprofit work up here where i live so mm -hmm. and i <clears throat> and i strongly encourage photographers whenever i can to you know, find a local foundation or local charity and just say, I'm a really good storyteller. Let me do 10 days a year for you or something like that. And mm. it's amazing. I'm really trying to connect foundations with photographers because wedding photographers have this skill set of walking into a house on a Saturday and making pictures, you know, very quickly. And mm. um, so it's, it's a good marriage there. Yeah. yeah. I like that. I especially like the fact that you go back and kind of work with prior couples that you've already shot the wins of. I love it's that amazing. idea. It's well, amazing. <laughs> how, how many of those have you actually done? And like, is that is that you contacting them or like like how how does that all work? Because I love that idea. It's. I mean, I would warn that it's really hard to schedule because kids are so hard to schedule. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's it sort of happens organically but you know um the comedian jerry seinfeld has been i shot his wife's first wedding mm -hmm. so before she was married to him and then she asked me to come shoot when they had two little kids and uh there's one they are one of the families i've done for 20 years and it's mm -hmm. just an extraordinary compilation of their life and uh events and graduations and bar mitzvahs and uh, so I think it's it's when people trust you and they let you into their lives at their wedding, they're going to trust you with their kids. They're going to trust you with their uh, grandparents' 80th anniversary, 80th party, or mm -hmm. you know, you just become that family trusted observer. Yeah, and it's really effortless too. If you walk in, everybody knows you, and uh, so it's you know whether it's for money or not or uh, it's that relationship continuing that relationship. Mm -hmm. I, I never want the wedding to be the last time I see people. Yeah, I get that. Cause you kind of have that feeling after every wedding that you, you're leave, you leave and you've, you've just spent this, you've just spent this amazing day with, with your couple and you just leave and probably you're most likely never going to see them again. Yeah. Like half our couples are from the States or, you know, they're, mm. they come over to have the Scottish wedding um, right. or the elopement. And um, it is like, we do keep in, like, you know, keep in contact over social media, but it's not the same. Um, yeah. Although I, I, I swear, it, they always say, oh, whenever you're over here, like 
come and give us a phone call. I, I swear one year I'm just going to. I'm gonna I'm gonna call everyone, and I'm just gonna do a little tour around. <laughs> I think I think it would be incredible, actually. And you know, one of the things I do that's very key to my process is I hand deliver pictures whenever I can after after the wedding. So six mm. eight weeks afterwards, we meet and then we have that glass of wine and kind of rehash the whole event because I I need to have that close the circle sort of thing. Yeah. It's easier because people do come through New York. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit simpler, but, yeah. um, but any way you can, you can make that personal connection and keep it, keep it alive. is kind of mm -hmm. extraordinary. Yeah. Is that, is that half the battle when you go to shoot a wedding that you've kind of built up a rapport already? And, yeah. you know, looking at your Instagram, you're, there's always pictures of you with, you know, guests or or couples or you're with their family and it's it's always lovely to see like is that is that because you know having that connection with those people will create or well, will allow you to create images that they'll love exactly and it's <clears throat> it's definitely taken me years to become mature enough to to establish that but mm. um I do it at the engagement session. I do it at the rehearsal dinner. Or, you know, I go to whatever events I can so that people get to sense of who I am mm -hmm. as a person, even if I'm not shooting a lot. I, you know, if they're doing a church rehearsal, I love those because it's all kind of, you know, nervous energy and yeah. the priest is yeah. getting impatient and it's, it's, you become part of the, of the whole troop of uh, actors basically. Mm. And, and, that gains allies. The bridesmaids are always really good at bringing me in. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a whole process of going from an outsider to an insider so that, um, like I've, I've, I think I've written before that the best compliment I ever got was when somebody came up to me and they like, they said, who are you? A cousin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was like, that's, that's, I've achieved family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, and it's you're not the hired help or you're not this creepy, you know, lurker outside. <laughs> yes, yeah. paparazzi basically. It's yeah, the anti paparazzi. Totally. Yeah. Hey, I'm Ashley from with Jack. I'm one of the sponsors of the Perspective podcast. With Jack helps to keep photographers in business by supporting them financially and legally if they have problems with a client or they make a mistake in their work. We've all had that fear of our CF card or our hard drive failing and losing important photos. You can find out more at withjack.co.uk. Head over there and find out how we can help you be a confident creative. How do you approach your pricing? Like, obviously you'll do a lot of two or three day weddings, but likes of, if you had a one day wedding, how do you approach pricing for that? As opposed to if you had like a 10 year later catch up family shoot and it was one day shooting, like how would you approach each of those individually? It's an interesting question because it's all made up, right? You can't write into Google, say how much is a, wedding photographer we're all we're all finding these rates and um it's i i i, I have a day rate for the wedding i don't do per hour because i don't want to be asking people at 11 o'clock do you want me to stay for an extra hour yeah. for this much oh, yeah. money i think that's, that's bad the worst. form yeah definitely the worst so i just do a, a day rate and I, I also tell them I know when it's time to leave, when the guys take their ties off and it gets sloppy. It's just, <laughs> you don't want me. And people get it. Yeah. Um, if there's another event on Friday, which, you know, the Americans love a Friday rehearsal dinner and sometimes a Thursday or Friday welcome party and a Thursday small dinner. Mm -hmm. So I love shooting that. So I'll kind of stagger the rates for different days um i don't do sunday brunches because i think they're not something to be photographed <laughs> but some <laughs> people really want that and yeah like mm -hmm. no um and then uh, i'm still trying to figure out the pricing for what's the right price for a family session but um i'm definitely lucky enough to have clients who don't worry about money so it's mm. what's a fair price and yeah 
include some beautiful archival prints and you know i i i'm sure i could have um made much more money by if i was more business oriented but i want that long relationship with these people based on trust and uh you know it's a it's it's a i want to feel good about my business on all ways yeah yeah what what do you actually offer your clients when they come to you and say, hey, I want you to shoot our wedding? And let, let's just pick the wedding day to, just to keep it easy. Like what, like how many so, prints and even how, how many images do you photograph and do you deliver all the photographs? And So if I'm shooting your wedding, Simon, I, I'm giving, I shoot the whole day. I'll edit... Um, maybe down to 800 pictures. But the first thing you'll see when you come to my studio uh, six weeks after the wedding is a box of prints that I've matted that has 15 beautiful... Let's see if I can show you. I know we're on a podcast, but there'll be 15 matted prints like this. Oh, lovely. And they go into a handmade box. Mm -hmm. So the idea is... I'm shooting 1,000, 2,000 pictures, whatever. I'm going to choose the 15 pictures that I think are works of art that should go up on your wall or actually they should stay in the box for your grandkids to find one day. Yeah. But what it does is it prevents you from having to go through the 1,000 pictures if you're a busy person or it prevents you from being at line in line at the coffee shop and getting a link on your phone and going, oh, my wedding pictures are in. Oh, this one's blurry. <laughs> this one's weird. Uh, yeah. I, I want to have the experience of unveiling the pictures in person with you and saying, your uncle's crazy or that speech by your little brother was amazing. Yeah. Or, you know, so it's a, it's a very kind of, uh, not a, like a tea ceremony, but it's a very kind of special thing to, build up expectation for eight weeks. And then the first pictures you see are really good. Yeah. I love the fact that you print out the images and I love the fact that you hand deliver to your clients. Have you, have you always done that? Or is that a thing that, I mean, I, I, I suppose, you know, you've always been from a film background. So maybe that's, maybe that just feels right to you. But from someone who comes from a digital background, they might be thinking, I never print stuff out. Like yeah. what, what's made you, you know, do it that way? I had one really important client who told me this incredible story of how she hired two photographers to shoot her husband's birthday party. Very wealthy American. And she said uh, they shot for three days and they sent a DVD back in the day <laughs> with 2000 pictures on the DVD mm -hmm. and said, here's your pictures. And she said, she looked at me and she said, John, we never looked at one of them. Oh, wow. And I thought, and she said, you choose the 15 best pictures and you deliver. And that one was in San Francisco. So I flew out there with this box and went to their house and she brought me into the, their living room and it had their art collectors. So they had, Warhols and Diane Arbus pictures and Avedon pictures. Mm -hmm. And then I laid the pictures out on the table and it was just, it all made sense that we're, I'm trying to raise wedding photography up to this higher level. Why would you send the link with, you know, <laughs> trying to get affirmation saying, didn't I do a good job? Here's <laughs> 4,000 pictures. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, not a logical idea to do this but it's a um it's almost like the chef who one chef just puts a ton of food on the table and says go eat it or a chef who says here i made you something special try this yeah yeah you're definitely like controlling their experience of the photos exactly. i love it um mm. like uh, do you make it easy for them to buy more prints if they want to like after they get the I, online gallery I, so uh, you know, I give them the box of 15, unveil that, and then I show them a slideshow of my 100 favorites. So that's kind of 
that gets really fun. Just, you know, here's the party, here's everything. Yeah. Um, and then I give them a, a contact sheet book that we print that has all the pictures. Maybe it's the top 800 um, with my favorites in the front and then everything in the back. Mm. And then I give them the link to everything. And if they want to make their own prints, that's fine. I don't really want to make, I, I'm not relying on prints to make my money. Mm. Um, so if they're making prints for their friends, they can make their own prints. If they want archival prints, they come to me. Yeah. 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 Does anyone come to you and be like, "Oh, can you uh, can you send me some Instagram edits or some or some uh, sl slideshows or put put these to music?" Or you know, I think because my clients are kind of shy and understated that some of them do that themselves, but mm. they they I, my my policy about that is it I follow their their lead if yeah. they want the pictures to be private. I'm okay with that if they want to, you know, put them on Instagram. It's all it's totally their their call. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, well, since you mentioned the the privacy aspect of images, I know, and fun enough because we're in a co working space, and someone in here was like they had a contact with the bride and she didn't like a, a particular image and was asked to remove the images. And we've had this conversation with quite a few photographers who seem kind of, kind of bummed out. Um, and almost, almost offended at being asked not to post the images online. And obviously over here in the UK, there is a GDPR. So, you know, technically by law, they have, the ability to say, "Hey, we we, you know, respect our privacy." As, essentially, what, what what's your thoughts on the whole, you know, a couple coming to you and asking for their privacy to remain intact, and what yeah, and what I would, would you say to photographers who do kind of feel offended or, or yeah, yeah, I I think that. Um the last thing I would ever want from one of my clients is for them to be disappointed in for me to break trust. Mm. So that would be the, that would be a big one. You know, once you put something out, it's out there forever. So I tread really lightly. I basically kind of wait till the bride posts something or I say, I love this picture so much. Mm. Do you mind if I post it? And they always say, yes. Um, but I do, I deal with all this after the wedding. If you do it before the wedding, they don't trust you. They don't know you. Yeah. So there's a huge difference of the before or after. Um, and I had one, a bride, sort of, a, an actress who wasn't super famous, but she was well known. And the night before her wedding, her fiance called me and said, you know, she's been burned by the press so many times. I'm like you promise you're not going to do anything. And I just said, why why would i betray your trust and mm. there's in this day and age if somebody wants to say something negative about you on instagram that would be just devastating for, uh, for me so yeah. there's nothing in it for me to to, to do anything negative mm -hmm. just to gain a couple of likes yeah yeah Speak, speaking of like posting images we're usually talking about blog posts or instagram and you've talked about how you don't really market yourself. You get most of your bookings through planners and referrals. So how how are you actually using social media? Like what what's the purpose of posting an image on there? I think at this point it's mostly to talk to photographers, and I mm. think brides pick up on it. But um, the voice I use in posting is we all worked on Saturday. Is everybody tired or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we're all about to work on Saturday night. So everybody let's don't make bad pictures. <laughs> you know, I kind of feel like I'm talking to, I have an image in my head of talking to a bunch of photographers driving to a wedding <clears throat> mm. or on a Tuesday who are all editing the wedding they shot on Saturday. So, um, I'm, I, I'm really, um, I love the photography community because it's, it is very collegial and it's not, um, cutthroat. And these conferences I've gone to recently where I met, uh, Joy and, uh, and 
you know, all the photo farm people and, you know, it's just a, it's a great camaraderie and, um, I fully support that and I want to amplify good things in that and, and not get people to be, uh, cutthroat or too professional or, mm. you know, abusing brides trust. And, um, so yeah, that's my, that's my spiel. <laughs> good. Good. Uh, I want to go back to something that we were talking about earlier. Um, one of your clients, uh, the family of Jerry Seinfeld, he remarked uh, and had a lovely thing to say about the, the the priceless view that your images provide for his family. And I really love the way he put that. But in the back of my head, I'm thinking, no, obviously with a client such as Jerry's and you know, you, you've had, you've built up a, a relationship and, and obviously there's that kind of background, but when you're with a family, whether it's the Seinfelds or, or, or not, what, how, how are you, how are you actually being around people while doing your craft? You know, hmm. you obviously built up the relationship, but do you have like, Go to jokes, or obviously not poses, <laughs> not poses, but like, is there a way that you it's are? A, no. It's a really good question because it's, um, you know, it's almost like a Jedi mind trick at this point where you have to get the shot without trying, and you have to yeah. get people to relax without telling them to relax, and you have to. It's a, it's a, it's a whole series of tricks, but it's almost that the less hard I try, the better the pictures are. And when you try too hard, especially with children, they just, mm. you know, if they smell fear or intimidation <laughs> or, <laughs> or something, it's all over. So it's a, um, I mean, it helps that, I think it helps a lot that I'm from a big family and I have my own kids and, mm. um, and I knew Jerry's wife before she became famous. So there's a, that trust level, but it's that it's, for some reason, maybe photographers think they can't just be human and they can't just sit and, uh, like I sit down at a wedding and have a glass of wine with people mm. at 10 o'clock and, um, I, I try to break that barrier down. So in family shoots, I come by myself with a small bag of cameras and, uh, I'd let the kids lead the way or, you know, I don't come in with a big plan. So it's a, uh, this kind of entering the, the job empty as opposed to mm. like an efficient military operation. That's the mindset. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's luring people into, Oh, John's here. It's not a big deal because mm -hmm. it's weird to be photographed. I think that's, you know, one of the things that we need to realize it's yeah. not a natural thing. Yeah. yeah. And I, I feel like every time I watch a photographer, and they have that ability. I'm always like, I know how hard it is to yeah. be able to capture those specific moments. And I, I find it really hard, especially doing video because, and sometimes I get a little bit jealous of photographers because they can like almost enter a moment, take a shot yeah. and then disappear. Whereas, yeah. I, as a video person, need to hold it for like minimum three seconds <laughs> or something to have a like a usable clip, and then I'm always seen. And there's that awkward like, "Are you filming me? What's happening? What's going on?" And those are moments yeah. I'm just ah, oh, it's so, <laughs> I don't know. It's just it's it's a really yeah, it's a really want, strange that, moment to be in. That's when you want the invisibility cloak. Yes, you want to yes. just be there and record. But yeah, um, and it, and it happens. It happens on the dance floor. You know, when people are a little bit more drunk and they've seen you, you're mm. a person now, and you're just like dancing with them. But like, say during the morning when their things are going on, yeah. yeah. Um, I think there's a lot about knowing when not to shoot, and mm. I think a lot of photographers come in so hot, and the you know, during hair and makeup, they're shooting and shooting and shooting. There's not, is there a photograph there? Maybe there's not. Yeah. So maybe you just, uh, make your presence known, but don't waste a lot of energy and, and maybe talk to people about, 
you know, how was the party last night or, or something. I think there's a, there's a, you have to allow yourself to not overly work and stress and, mm. and what's, what energy are you bringing to the building or to the, to the room? Yep. Are you a positive force or a negative force or a stress point? Or, you know, I'm very big on being a uh, stress reliever for people. I want to take, make them feel good. So if somebody comes in with a, uh, an issue about their transport or something, I try to say, go over to the planner, leave the bride alone. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We exactly. can be helpful. Yeah, definitely. I think too many people come to the bride and you are left to be like a, a, a barrier almost, but just yes. please just, you don't need to, it's fine. Like, yeah. And and by the way, if, if, if you're a photographer or a video person that, that, you know, has an issue and goes to the bride, you're going to the wrong person. I, Cause I've seen you yeah. guys do it from time to time, going to the wrong person. Don't go to the bride. Um, anyway, uh, John Martha Stewart mentioned, uh, how you elevated wedding photography to an almost art form level. And when I read that, I was like, fucking hell as if, you know, <laughs> like praise. that is, that is killer praise. Like, how do you, how do you feel about that kind of comparison? Or you, or you just like, yeah, fuck yes, yes, I am. <laughs> clearly. Thank you, Martha. Obviously. What do you mean, almost? I know exactly. <laughs> when you read that out, that's what I was thinking. Almost. That's a bit of a sly dig. <laughs> Wait, is it? Is she, well, no, to an R form. You're right. I actually added that. So she actually what did you does, add that? She, she, I added that. <laughs> I'm thinking we're being, too, we were friends, we're being too complimentary, John. <laughs> Slap us. <laughs> God, this podcast is over. <laughs> oh. oh my God. Yeah, but I mean, how do you, how do you feel no, when someone puts your work on that no, kind of it was, high pedestal? I mean, it really, it, that really was ex extraordinary. The, the Martha quote, the Martha mm. essay and the Seinfeld quote both kind of blew me away because, right? um, you know, I, I hadn't even asked Jerry for the for a blurb, but I was at their house photographing the kids and mentioned that I had a book coming out and he offered, which, and his wife just dropped her jaw saying he never does that, you know. So Amazing. that was again this reflection of that I was an insider or, you know, somehow a friend of the, uh, in, in that, in the bubble. Um, and I asked Martha to write it because she had really helped me get my start back in the 90s in her when she launched her wedding magazine which really changed the whole industry um so i rode a really long wave with her and uh i was amazed that she took the time to write that essay and uh so yeah it means the world yeah and um if martha ever hears hears that clip <laughs> and comes for me i'm sorry i didn't mean to misquote you i did it i'm just a fool okay i'm sorry <laughs> Oh my God. Um, yeah. So your, your work is candid and raw. Um, or at least that, I mean, that's obviously we've asked you how you describe your style. That's how I would describe your style. Like very honest, raw. In fact, some of the images of, of kids who are just bored as all hell. I love that. Oh, just I, honestly, I love those images. Um, how, how do you, do you create an environment for images to happen or are you completely just hands off? So I, I sort of have a feeling that for a long time, the range of acceptable subjects was really narrow at a wedding. So photographers yeah. stayed within this narrow list mm -hmm. and all my, well, since I've started doing it, I've always thought that everything's part of the wedding. That was always another one of these mantras I have, maybe five of them, whatever, but everything's part of it. Yeah. So that the melancholy that happens at a lot of weddings, the slightly sad person sitting by themselves, that's all part of the narrative. And why are we keeping it just in this kind of happy place of Disney and Hallmark and, you know, <laughs> everything's pretty Let, yeah. like, let's expand it. And, and I've challenged photographers to, you know, how else do we reinvent this genre that is kind of the same every Saturday all over <laughs> the world? And, <laughs> yeah. you know, people get dressed, people get married, people get 
drunk or people get dancing. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's why I divide the book into a sort of three chapters. Chapter one, their people are apart. Chapter two, they come together. And chapter three, they all go crazy. But, um, you know, since the form is kind of the same, there's the photography doesn't have to be the same. It's mm. And there's lots of room to try new things. It's challenging because it's basically always kind of a similar structure. But um, I just think there's so many emotions that don't get proper play at a wedding and that's that's what kept me interesting yeah interested is is that it goes from kind of uh bittersweet sadness like i have a picture in the book of two people dancing in an empty hall uh, a ballroom and it's just incredibly sad and poignant picture but they're in their own bubble yeah it just doesn't look like a happy wedding picture but it it is. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just putting forth this idea that everything's part of it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You, me you mentioned earlier that you never want to be on trend because that means there's going to be a cliff edge soon. But <laughs> yes. do, do you pay attention to what is trending in the wedding industry? And is there anything that you've seen recently that's caught your eye? Don't too, too much. I, I mean, I've always been kind of on the edge of the industry and it's really just since the book came out that I've started doing these podcasts and going to conferences and, and it's been great fun, really uh, dynamic. Um, but I, I keep an eye on it, but I don't follow too much because you can just get in that bubble. But, yeah. um, when I heard that there's a term out there called plandids, that's when I just got really sick. A what? fake, uh, where you fake a candid. All where right. You have your friends pretend to be laughing or something. And people said, oh, yeah, that's a thing. We're doing plandids. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've never heard that so phrase wrong. before. <laughs> I hope it doesn't go across the pond. So I've, don't yeah, let it in. I've never heard that. But I instantly think of all those kind of um, stock image sites. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. It, it makes me feel like my younger sister, whenever she's doing photos with like her and her partner, they're always yeah. like, oh, let, let's now do a candid one. And they always do just go, <laughs> so that must be yeah. what you're talking about. But I've it. never heard that phrase before. Let's do yeah. a candid one. <laughs> yeah. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> it's like, and basically it is, let's just laugh usually. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, there's something not right about that. But then, you know well, what? I guess the idea. Yeah, I guess the idea that is that it's too hard to wait for a candid or so you want to be able, I mean, there's a bottom line that photographers want to have repeatable go-to tricks. They want to have their bag of tricks. And, and I think, you know, that, I think that's one of the things that since I was a photographer first, before I was a wedding photographer, I had certain ways of working and maybe I have a bag of tricks, but it's not so reduced to these um <laughs> simple things yeah we all have our bags of tricks yeah we've all got them yeah. i love a good prism <laughs> 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 well it, g give me one of your tricks john g g <laughs> give me one of them surprise our listeners um okay well <clears throat> if there's a group of people in a circle in a you know a bunch of guys in a group I'll go into the group. If I can find find a way in, I'll go in, I'll shoot. If they're all telling a story and laughing, I'm not going to stand back. I'm going to find a way and it's you have to be graceful about it. But if somebody lets you in, you have to shoot that from inside the part, inside the laughter rather than <clears throat> external. Um, and one of the things I'd love to make a trend is, you know how people all line up for a group picture and put their arms around each other, which is extremely not attractive <laughs> look. Um, sometimes I'll come to a group of people during cocktail hour and they'll be in a beautiful semicircle and then they see you and then they all line up. So I walk towards people and say, nobody move. And everybody, and I, then I say, everybody just turn to me. And it's so much more graceful. And I kind of feel like, it's the way people did it in the old days in Hollywood that a group of actors would just turn their head rather than their bodies. Yeah. So breaking yeah. the line is my trend for 2024. All right. Okay. I like that. 
I, 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 when you mentioned like a group of guys like circling, I instantly thought of like those moments later on at night when it's, when it's getting dark and the boys decide to light a cigar. Like the, none of them smoke or whatever, but they all, <laughs> you have to have a, a, a little cigar. And there's that moment where they're all just having fun. Half of them don't know how to smoke. Half of them don't know how to light the cigar. And you're just, right. you're trying to get into this little weird moment that probably they're trying to hide away from the bride because, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. They're not supposed to be smoking. It's unhealthy. I don't. I don't know. There's. There's always that moment in my head that I'm always looking at. Um, yeah. But are there any? Do you have any um, exciting collaborations or or projects or anything on the horizons other other than Thrive 2024 next year? Yes, I'm very excited about Thrive. And Lisa Devlin is a total gem, and she is. Um, I'm excited to to be on the road with her in Scotland and London and uh, and meet photographers who I haven't met before. That's kind of a, it's a whole new uh, venture up there. So yes. uh, it should be exciting. Um, you know, I, I don't know what's, um, I'm heading over to Paris this week to Perry Photo and hoping to see if I can stir up some other projects. Um, but uh, so I have to get back to you on that one. Okay, <laughs> yeah. stir up some projects. What do you mean? I have some projects to show to to some people and see if there's interest in them. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay. Nothing you we'll can see. reveal here, obviously. <laughs> 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 Don't worry, I, I won't make you say it. Um, cool. Well, it's my favorite time, That's isn't it? Time. Oh no, it's not. I've actually skipped a question here. Uh, obviously. This is a you guys prepared for this, didn't you? <laughs> we try, we try, because otherwise See. we're just fucking two guys being ourselves. It's like, <laughs> so you've been doing this for thirty years, you or or over thirty years, hundreds of weddings. How, if I was to ask you to describe your career so far in one phrase, what would it be? Man. Oh um, man. <laughs> <laughs> how have I how have I made it? Um I th yeah, how have I not burned out? I mm. think is the is the really interesting thing and I think that I had a really slow it was not a rocket rise. So I think um that's why I've I've said this thing of don't try it. Don't go too fast. Give yourself time to develop. Cause I think it really took me years to, to develop a way of working in my personality and in my business. Um, you know, I didn't really start making, I, I wouldn't say I officially started until I was 30. So I'd shot a bunch of weddings beforehand, but kind of the start of my business when I was 30. So, you know, you got to give yourself time to, to ripen as a, an artist. And uh, so I think that I've, I've had a long, steady uh, career that without burning out. Mm. Yeah. I like how that. that? How, how long, how long have you been sort of limiting it to 10 weddings a year? Is that a fairly new thing or has that been around for a while? Yeah. I think I was aiming for a dozen for the last five years or so, six yeah. years. And that's somewhere around eight to 10, eight to 12 is really good. I have a big family. So every year, one of my nieces or nephews calls me and says, Uncle Johnny, <laughs> get married. And I'll say, here are the dates you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Late October is really good. Yeah. Because oh, I feel cool. that limiting it to that <clears throat> and also diversifying what you do probably plays into not burning out as well. Mm -hmm. Like I think a lot of wedding photographers who go full on and do loads of weddings a year there's probably they burn out quicker than yep. the ones that limit it to a manageable amount mm. and i had those years in the and you know when i was first starting out i was doing 25 a year and just crashed and burned so you know i went from 20 25 28 and then five so wow <laughs> um, but you know i also learned something uh, I had a job for Travel and Leisure magazine to photograph over on Isla. So I passed through Glasgow. Oh, yeah. And I thought, I, I, so I spent a weekend there and photographed Brooklatic and a few of the other places. Oh. And I realized that from a brand standpoint, 
small batch whiskey is really an interesting parallel to what I do. It's, mm. you know, I'm limited edition, uh, kind of a smoky peat, not for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and because I was at a bar there on Isla and there was uh, a Japanese guy who had flown from Tokyo to go to this bar to have whiskey. And I thought, you know, that's really what I want. I want people to, to see me as this special thing, the special mm. part of their wedding. And um, instead of being, you know, Jameson or whatever, I want to be just for the certain people who really get it. So yeah. it's kind of an interesting thing to see it up close and personal there. Mm. Yeah. I like that. Now, time for my favorite part of the podcast. Because I get to talk about actual images and hear their backstory. So, John. We're going to pull some images in the TV. I've selected, to, is it three or four? I can't <coughs> remember. I might have gone more. I've gone for four because I couldn't decide. You're right. Start um, with this one because you okay. mentioned it earlier. So, you, you can see the screen, John? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. So, the reason I picked this image um, is because it was actually the first image of yours that I saw. And... I, I'm going to admit this to you. I had never seen your work before. And that gave me an interesting insight for when I first looked at this image. So I looked at this and thought, it's just, it, actually, I, I can't remember what I thought, but I did think, why is everything not symmetrical? <laughs> And that's because oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's because Instagram has trained me clearly to, to perfection. There's a always, perfect image. There's always a common annoyance at weddings where the ceremonies never, the bride and groom never stand perfectly down the middle aisle. <laughs> yeah, and so not having wow. understood what your work is or anything, I looked at this and I thought, there's there's three doors in the back. There's one chandelier at the top. Couldn't you? Couldn't you have just centered it? <laughs> like, what? What the hell's the West, going on? Wes Anderson effect. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. What? What the hell is this guy doing? <laughs> so, and and that's that's actually why this this started my. I mean, I don't want to say love affair, but like I I went I I have seen so many of your images, and I. I hate you because I can't buy your book. <laughs> All right? Yeah. Sure you can. It's 800 quid. <laughs> it's 800 quid. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> but like, so this was the first image and I thought, wow, he's like, this is intentional. So I want to hear the story behind this image and what your thought process was. And um, yeah, tell me about it. Will you, will you be surprised to know that there wasn't thought process? I mean, it's, it's, it's a, um, but it, that's so fascinating because I don't notice that it's not symmetrical <laughs> because if it had been symmetrical, I would have blocked her eye line and I would have entered her, I would have affected her wedding in a negative way. Mm. So that's, that gets that point that when photographers interject, they're changing the flow of that wedding. And telling either if the photographer had stood in the middle or if the photographer tells a bride to stand over there um, when clearly she's deep in thought or she's anticipating the biggest moment of her life, mm. my job was to be invisible. And um, I mean, talk about a privileged position to be in this room. This is a very famous part of the White House. And yeah. um fly on the wall i think i got two frames of it and it was with a 50 millimeter noctilux which is a 1.0 lens which is Oof. you know her nose is in focus maybe yeah. i'd stop down to something more but it's a really critical focus thing and mm. um but it was almost this moment uh before even when if you watch a ski race like somebody's about to go on the ski jump it's the moment before they go down the jump yeah and there's that focus and tension and drama and so there was a lot of that was what was in the air mm. and um and i also there was kind of a quiet calm which is what i really love about it it's a 
sort of peaceful picture of anticipation. Yeah. Yeah. You can, I think you can definitely, like, there, you can tell from essentially it's a bridal portrait, but you can all, you can get the story from it. Just like, as you say, her eye lines look into yeah. something and there is that focus. Mm. And I think so many photographers would probably have just went, hey, just, just look at me for a second because it's bridal portrait. Yeah. They maybe want them looking down the lens. Yeah. And that would have just killed that story to that image, mm. like the, the yeah. emotion to it. And do you know one thing that when I saw this image, I thought, and it's kind of a bit of a shame, but, and now the name of it is, is, uh, generate Phil. What was that in Lightroom when you can select something and go replace with this? Oh, the AI. Mm -hmm. the, 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 yeah. Like I'm, I'm, I always look at what's in the frame. And there's like almost like a wheelchair or, or a Zimmer frame or something in the background or chairs are out of whack. There's someone in the background that you can see they're very out of focus. And I just thought, hmm. how many people are going to use that tool to get rid of these elements? Right, that, right, right. That when, when, like, when I look at them, I, I love this image because those things are in the background. And so right. many of your images are of like... You know, brides getting ready and they're standing on the the bed and they're you know they're you know, like trying to get the dress on and it's awkward and the, the room's a mess and I yeah. love that it yeah. gives a sense of the scene and it, yeah I just think people are going to be removing these you know so yeah. you, even even if they don't have that tool they'll think oh I'm just going to quickly move the chairs. And right. and suddenly the moment that particular moment would be gone. That that image would not be captured. It would be the perfect kind of almost mock up of that image once yeah. th once they had looked around and gone. Oh, I'm just going to move the chair, or you know. Yeah, it's a it's definitely a challenge, and every photographer is going to find their balance. But mm. it kind of goes back to the trust you have with your clients. So you know, I have clients who who understand that that's a core value to me that the pictures might be emotionally messy or physically messy. I'll move some plastic bags out of the way. I'll move <laughs> yeah. ugly things that, you know, but that's, it's an aesthetic decision of what is and, and what's practical. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to move anything in this scene because I wasn't going to move. I was frozen <laughs> in, a, in a corner. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but it's a, it's definitely an interesting issue of you know sometimes second shooters are in the background mm. and do you leave that picture person in i crop my pictures sometimes not a lot but yeah. if i can make it stronger so it's training your aesthetic of what of what makes your picture your picture yeah yeah and and just before anyone's thinking oh i clear rooms all the time i, I i'm always getting rid of stuff so am i like <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. not a bad thing to be, to be to be doing that in certain moments, but this image yeah. would not have been captured if John had gone and tried to move these things and planned it around. Uh, yeah. Also, John, is this a, an oval room? Is it a, yes? A, right. Okay. Yes. Because you did say like you were you you, you, de you described as your you were trapped in the corner of an oval room. So I just, <laughs> just want to point that out. You might be losing your mind at this point. Okay. <laughs> It's fine. We're, we're all crazy Thanks here, but just so you know. <laughs> and with this image. So, um, I don't know whose wedding this is, but I did notice that this is a particular angle that you like to capture um, from certain weddings. Um, and I wanted to know why why this angle and not why I would assume most photographers would do and capture the the bride's face coming down. Yeah. What is that about this point of view that you like to kind of capture? I, I think one of my uh, <laughs> traits as a photographer is that I'm often in the wrong place. And I'm... <laughs> <laughs> On purpose? I, no, <laughs> no, I just... Okay. I Because I don't plan, I react, and then I go, oh, I am totally in the wrong place. <laughs> And then I make that work. Yeah. So, okay. um, I mean, I also love shooting towards the light, but I don't think I was that tuned to it. This was on film. This is years ago, not early nineties. Oh, okay. But it was, it was, um, 
you make a commitment. You're either at the front of the aisle or the back of the aisle. And because I don't leave the bride, mm. um, I'm usually at the back of the aisle and I'll get one shot of her going by. But this, there was, I had also been pretty keyed into the father daughter relationship, which, which was super strong. Mm -hmm. So I thought, um, I think in uh, afterwards, I'm thinking this is really what he felt. This is, this gives an impression of that, that um, iconic thing of the father and the br bride walking down the aisle mm. in a new way. And it becomes not about what their faces are. It becomes about their, like their arms linked together. And it's, and it's, again, it's that narrative quality. It's, you can almost hear the music playing yeah. and you can feel the, the hot light on her face and, um, it's really kind of trying to take it beyond the fact and make it into the fiction. Mm. Um, I, I also love that it's black and white. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, maybe that's a creative person. I mean, I just know how bad church lighting is. Yeah. Like, those are terrible color for some reason. Uh, yeah. Not in all churches, sorry. That was a bit <laughs> of a, an open comment, but in general, um, but yeah, it, it's kind of nice actually knowing that that's film. I don't need to then ask you your mindset on like adding grain or like your post processing, <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> which I, which you know is a bit of a fascination with me and what people want to say about their images. But it's that just that you capturing that moment. That's all the processing that you do. I'm I'm assuming unless you process your images or d develop no. them, no, you'll send them to a house. I I did in those days. I I'd oh. go home from the wedding and do it that night or the next morning. Oh, okay. Yeah. But but it was also there's a lot of uh, for years. One of our phrases has been "pray for focus." You know, like <laughs> that because you know in the days of film, you shot and then you went home and yeah. hoped, and um, but it made you really good at focusing because mm. when you'd be disappointed, but. For me, there's also an elegance to this picture. There's kind of a, a Hollywood star. She was gorgeous, and um, she just had a gracefulness to her. So I kind of wanted to retain that and not, you know, lock it into something so predictable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can kind of see what you mean, especially with the the light, you know, cre like creeping from uh, behind the the dad's head and the light above. Yeah. Kind of looks like other oh, camera flashes. So. I, I, yeah. can, I can, I can, I can, I can see what you mean. Yeah. Um, but let's let's next move image. on. Yeah. Next image. Next image. There's two others. So usually I try to stick with three images. Um, but I really just wanted to know one. I until about an hour before recording this, I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on here. And then nice. Greg was like, "Oh, it's the guy's chucking um, confetti at the at John." I'm like, yeah. "Oh, or, of or course. rice? Maybe is it rice or rice?" <laughs> Yeah. But for the life of me, I couldn't fucking figure out what what the hell was happening here. Which is kind of great. I, yeah. I like that that it was not clear. Yeah. And I think there's something kind of fun about that, not having every picture be so understandable immediately. But mm -hmm. um, this was, again, one of my first weddings for a magazine person who had worked at Martha Stewart and okay. asked me to shoot her wedding. And, you know, I was so clueless that I didn't, no, there was no rule book back then. There was no way mm -hmm. to to know what a wedding picture was. So, um, and I had a camera that was, it was before I had a Leica, and I had a camera that kind of would sometimes just go off on its own and do its own expo <laughs> exposure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a little on camera flash, uh, and and I think I was the bridegroom were about to walk out, mm -hmm. and I was doing a test, or I was kind of seeing what it was like uh -huh. and maybe he threw some I, or else I don't I actually don't remember it might have been I came out first and they threw rice at me and then the bride and groom <laughs> were behind I don't know but yeah but it's that idea of just kind of um shooting free and you know and with the flash I didn't know what I would get so yeah that was kind of interesting too yeah, yeah definitely it goes, uh, it goes to this sort of with our films, you said about the prism, but you're quite often trying to just confuse the viewer for a split second. And yeah. that's again, what, what happened to you with this image? Yeah. You yeah. Slightly confused. So it made you stop and think about it. Yeah. 
So, yeah. Confuse me. It didn't confuse Greg. Not for a second. <laughs> it's had me boggled for a couple of days. And then Greg's like, no, you idiot. <laughs> Clearly confetti. I'm like, oh, fuck. Of course it is. Last Honestly. one. Honestly. So, so this is the last one. Um, I... So the other two were blurry and out of focus and kind of had that kind of behind behind light and then mm. in front of flash. And then I just thought I, I wanted to have one that was just al- almost how I would describe like real life. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. and when I saw this and I, I took it off your Instagram, so I'm not sure if it's an actual image that you have given to the couple but i really like this because i you would never think to take this image or Hmm. many photographers would never think to take this image why did you take this image and and what is happening here i'm so glad you chose this one because it's from the last wedding i shot oh okay and it was a uh Thursday. I haven't unveiled the pictures to the bride, but she saw this one. Oh, thank um, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a Thursday afternoon w- a wedding in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. She works at the lab that I get, send my film to. So she's like the person who takes my babies wow. and puts them into the what? lab. So, <laughs> so I'm very attached to her and she's a super kind person. And, um, but it was in between. It's all about these in between moments. It mm. was the ceremony had ended. Maybe they were bustling. I don't know what they were doing, but they were. Um, it was the next thing was about to happen. We were going to walk over to dinner. Mm. But there was also it was a fifty person wedding in the park, so there was a cross country running team of high school kids <laughs> ah, doing that's laps. That's what's <laughs> happening in the background, right? Okay. <laughs> Which I just thought was fabulous yeah. and. You know, there's always many layers of things going on in life, and this just put it all into perspective. You know, it's like there's a young girl, and one day she'll get married. There's, you know, there's different parts of of things simultaneously, which Mm. is fascinating to me. And um, this is a digital Leica picture, and you know, the Leica is really good at seeing simultaneity because it's a rangefinder. You're not focusing. You're Mm. I shoot first and focus subconsciously Mm -hmm. but um but it's a very fast way of working and it captures everything at once so it's kind of everything everywhere all at once mentality can i talk about one of the aspects i actually love the most about this image and i'm 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 gonna assume you like this is just random happenstance but if you look at her bouquet the pink and the red and the yellow the same pink and yellow mm, on the schoolgirl mm-hmm. shoes. Mm. And uh, I don't know why I like that, <laughs> but it's like a little bit of a serendipity there. And um, uh, unless it was completely purposeful, but you let me know. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, see, you, that's, all, that's that, that, this is, uh, you know what? Martha was right. It's almost art. <laughs> almost <laughs> art, Barbara. You're so close, John. <laughs> You're, you're thinking he waited for that girl to do another lap. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Nope, I'm not yeah. photographing this girl. It's got to be the next one. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, it's a, it's actually an interesting point because I think um, I probably, I wouldn't have, there's other frames from this series that didn't work in the same way. And mm. even this one, it's not a flattering picture of her. It's an awkward picture of her. Yes. But I kind of love the triangle above her head that the, the dress became a triangle. I thought that's, I don't know. I don't know what this picture makes me feel, but it makes me feel that at wet at weddings, you're tugged in a million different directions and you're kind of an object and people yeah. are doing things to them. And, um, but it, it's, it's, I'm glad that you like it. Cause it's, you know, it's not a, uh, glamorous, uh, it's, but it's, but it is real. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and it will bring the viewer, bring her back to this place in twenty years, which is really what I'm always looking for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quick question: though. Who's this? I think it was just a f- friend. Yeah, one okay. of her friends. Who, so, so yeah. someone from the wedding. Yes. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. obviously. Yeah. 
let's talk a bit more about Thrive. Oh, yes. We, we've mentioned that a couple of times, but probably not enough for Lisa. Yeah. But <laughs> what, <laughs> what can people expect from a shoot session with you? Because people can book on shoot sessions. They may already be sold out. I'm not sure. Mm. But what can they expect from one of your sessions? I think we're not going to shoot. I think we're going to talk. Okay. All oh, right. interesting. Okay. I think what I've found is the most valuable thing I can do. I think everybody knows how to shoot. Everybody knows how to take pictures. Everyone's really good. But I, ha I have a feeling that uh, photographers don't get a chance to talk about this stuff. All the things we've talked about, all these imperfections mm -hmm. and melancholy and complexity and all these things. And I think it's a super valuable subject to to sit around in a circle and hear about anxiety and hear about uh post-wedding blues and stress on family and you know there's a million subjects that i think i can lend some expertise or experience on and uh, just give some turn i like to turn people inside out and upside down and say the industry tells you X, but you know what? J might work for you. Or <laughs> uh, there's just a lot of different approaches that aren't being considered. And mm. um, and I think it's almost like group therapy, but with no uh, revealing <laughs> complex emotional things. But <laughs> yeah. I think photographers need these these open sessions of just. Uh, asking the question they never get to ask and mm -hmm. uh, I've done it a few times and it's super um, thrilling and super uh, positive in my experience so mm -hmm. uh, I, I think Lisa's okay with me doing this approach and um, maybe I'll take a picture maybe I'll have I don't know but I'd like to improvise a little, little bit within this uh, uh, idea that you know, we're not professionals, we're something better. Yeah, yeah. That's quite refreshing. Like I like the sound of where that's going, the sort of campfire campfire therapy. Yeah. Like, yeah. <clears throat> and it makes sense for you, I think. Like a shoot I session like it, yeah. where it's like just the couple and they're going out to get a couple of photos doesn't seem suited. Yeah. 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 And and I can't show people how I work if people are watching. You know, it's like that the observers will affect the session. And yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And I, th I, I know there might be a few listeners out there thinking, oh, but I really want to build my portfolio. I know these sessions are good for that. And I've been at past thrives where people have gone and done the shoot uh, with other photographers and they've gone in and the the best part about it, nearly every single person has always said the best part is when you sit around that table, you look at the images mm. and you talk about it. Yeah. You like talking about the art is or the almost art. Sorry, sorry, John. Almost art. <laughs> is <laughs> is uh, is vitally That's gonna be the name of my next book, Almost <laughs> Art. <laughs> the failed pictures of John Dolan. <laughs> Oh, please, please. Uh, oh, maybe, maybe I can buy a copy this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I, I know it's it's if if you want to build a portfolio, that that doesn't sound appealing. But I promise you, like opening up like that is is gonna affect you in, in far greater ways than yeah. a couple of nice, you know, getting a couple of nice images from you know a shoot. So, I, yeah. yeah, I also think that I also tell people if you need to build a portfolio, just shoot a wedding for free. Yeah, Find right. somebody who's deserving and just say, "Can I just come?" Uh, you know, uh, and and take some pictures for free, and mm -hmm. uh, and if I'm able to do whatever I want, that's it. It's a great thing for people who get stuck to reset, mm -hmm. to do a job where you don't have any obligation and. Uh, and maybe it's a small wedding in a backyard or something, but or to do these other kind of nonprofit jobs, but um, that won't get you the same portfolio. But but I think there's ways to do it, and and style shoots are great for some people. I just think there's plenty of people who know how to do that. I'm not 
I'm not especially good at those. So yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. You you've obviously like like gave a bounty of knowledge in this episode already. But what's one sort of key takeaway that you would give to a newcomer who's just a year or two into the business just now into the industry? Um, I think it's really useful to to take that long view of the pictures and realize that you're a historian, you're a cultural historian and a family historian. So, you know, just, uh, I'm sure there's the same pressure on people in the UK as in the States to get those details, but, um, find a way to make pictures of each wedding that you want somebody to discover and, and, cherish in 20 years and mm. uh, and look at old pictures and see what's look at your grandparents pictures and see why they work um, and so you know ignore the trends but look back and see how you make a, a, a real photograph that will have staying power mm. yeah I I love what you just said there family historian uh, yeah have, have you have you described yourself as that before or <laughs> Yeah, I've t I take that role really seriously, mm. and um, I've had people, even this year, ask me for a picture because somebody in the picture had passed away, and they wanted it for the funeral booklet. And yeah. I thought, you know, that's amazing. That these people looked so they were so happy on the dance floor, and I have that picture of them. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, mm. it's 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 so much more than just a job where you're taking a bunch of pictures and selling some eight by tens and you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's much bigger, bigger deal. Yeah. Cause, cause everyone's using the term storyteller right now. I don't know if you know, story, it's oh, been like that for about 10 years, <laughs> but uh, I can see family historian becoming the, the new phrase, <laughs> you know, trademark it. <laughs> um, John, other than the imperfect, perfect, which you can get hold of, <laughs> You Do you have any book recommendations for our listeners, whether that is photography books or business oh. books? No business books. Um, I mean, I I'll think of a good photography book, but oh, I know there's a there was a French photographer. He would be my main influence, my main favorite guy named Jacques Henri Lartigue, L A R T I G U E. Mm -hmm. And he had a book called Diary of a Century. And he he was he's well known because he was a child photographer from a wealthy family in Paris. And he just, you know, he photographed this the this fancy life, but he was photographing when the airplane was invented and then when race cars were invented. And um, and he just was kind of a genius as a kid. And he then he photographed his lovers and his relationships in a very personal way um and he just kind of made photographing your own life into an art form um so one of his books would be great um and also you know i've gotten a lot out of reading detective novels because they're very visual and how a detective walks into a room and reads the room mm -hmm. um so you know find some genre of short stories or novels and you know, or look at films from a, that point of view uh, of where the camera is and what are they seeing and how are they reading the situation? Because that's our job. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So I don't think we've had MD recommend detective novels before. No, <laughs> never. Yeah. Never. Um, well, John, thank you very much for coming on this podcast and speaking with us. For people who want to see more of your work, where, where can they find you online? I think Instagram's probably the best place. Um, my website, johndolan.com, is there, but um, I don't. I don't keep up the blog too much. I put more into the Instagram, so mm. that's one way. All right, awesome. And people can find us at Perspective by Cinemate um, on Instagram and I think TikTok sometimes. Uh, thank you for uh, sponsoring this episode with Jack. Always appreciated. And are you ready for Thrive? Are you ready, Greg? I'm ready. I'm ready for it. Uh, well, get ready for a two-day all-star photography workshop conference taught by six phenomenal mentors. The 18th and 19th of March at the Dunglass Estate and the 21st and 22nd of March at the Hoxton Holborn in London. 
definitely get your tickets now before they sell out. Book your shoot sessions, please, before they sell out. And um, yes, definitely do that. If you have loved this conversation, you can hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel, which is www.youtube.com forward slash at perspective by Cinemate. And you can get this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. However, in the meantime, enjoy your thrive.